and start the meeting. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to the November 2020 uh, Independent Taxpayer Oversight Committee or ITOC meeting. Uh, thank you staff for uh, pulling this together in our, uh, what I guess is now our typical format. Uh, special welcome to any uh, any guests or any members of the public who are here to speak on uh, on specific items or on anything in general. In fact, we're always uh, happy to have members of the public join us. Uh, as we've just gone through this, but for the record, if the clerk could confirm that we have a quorum, Tessa. Thank you, Chair Kinney. We do have a quorum for this meeting. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Tessa. I'd like to update the members and the public on our process for both member and public comments. The primary members will be using their cameras and will take live public comments. Members are asked to turn on their cameras when they have a comment or question, and then I will recognize you. I'd like to ask our committee liaison, Ariana, to provide a quick reminder on how the public comments will work. Ariana? Thank you, Chair Kenny. Uh, just a quick reminder for members of the ITOC and members of the public about our process for both member and public comments. Members will be using their cameras, as Chair Kenny mentioned, and we will take live public comments. And members are asked to turn on their camera when they have a comment or question, and then Chair Kenny will recognize you. As noted on the cover page of today's meeting agenda, in addition to emailing comments, the public may also provide live comments during today's meeting. And in order to provide live comments, you can join today's Zoom meeting through the link or by dialing one of the numbers from your phone that are provided on the cover page of today's meeting agenda. Join the meeting by clicking on the join webinar link provided in the confirmation email that you would receive upon registering. And when public comments are called for on an item on the Zoom platform, click on the raise hand icon in the Zoom toolbar on the top right hand uh, corner of the screen and then the chair will call on you by the name that you provided. And if you are participating by telephone, please press star nine and the chair will call on you by the last three digits of your telephone number. The instructions for providing live comments are also on the bottom of the cover page of today's meeting agenda, which can be accessed from the homepage of Sandag's website at www.sandag.org. And all comments, whether emailed or live, will be made part of today's meeting record. Thank you, Chair Kinney. All right, well, Ariana, thank you very much. With that said, we'll go ahead and begin the, uh, the agenda. Uh, agenda no, item number one is the approval of the minutes. Uh, <clears throat> before we begin, uh, Tessa, are, are there any members of the public who wanna talk about the minutes? I do not see any hands raised for public comments, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, back to, to the committee, are there any, uh, is there any discussion on the approval of the minutes? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. Move to approve. Uh, Mr. Halpern, do, I, do we have a second? A second. We have a second. Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, <clears throat> Tessa, if you could call for the vote. Thank you. On item number one, Chair Michael Kennedy. Approve. Vice Chair Sunny House. Approve. Uh, contractor Construction, Mr. Brad Barnum. Approve. Uh, Mr. Dustin Fuller. I will mark as absent. Uh, Mr. Stuart Halpern. Approve. Mr. Les Hopper. Approve. And Mr. Jeff Schneider. I will mark as absent. That item passes with those members present. Thank you, Tessa. On to item number two. Item number two is public speaking for uh, for anyone who wishing to speak on an on, on anything other than an, an agenda item. So this is an opportunity to speak on anything other than what's on the agenda today. Tessa, do we have any members of the public who would like to speak? I do not see any hands raised at this time. Thank you, Tessa. With that, we will close item number two and move on to item number three, the executive director's report. I understand that Mr. Linthicum is going to provide the director's report today. Jim? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a number of updates um, we'd like to give to you. Um, first off, uh, you may recall that 
wait a second, it has disappeared off my screen. There we go. Okay, you may recall that our um, independent auditor issued a salaries and compensation performance and compliance audit in August. Um, since that time, we have um, developed a draft audit action plan. And we're gonna present that to our audit committee in the near future. And we're also working with our um, Office of Independent Auditor on, on what goes into that plan. And they're having a great exchange. Um, after, after we present it to the audit committee and we're working with the audit committee chair on setting a date for that, then we will also present that to the board. Um, next item is our regional plan. There's been a lot of talk locally about our 2021 regional plan, and now there's a lot of interest statewide. And in fact, this morning, Hassan and the regional plan team are presenting uh, the plan, which is a data-driven analytical process for the vision, and they're presenting it to a joint meeting of CARB, which is the California Air Resources Board, the CTC, which is the California Transportation Commission, and ATD, which is the California Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, I can tell you, the entire Sanday uh, team is so proud of these planners and all the work that they've done to bring this, this bold vision to the state leaders now. But also on a local basis, we're continuing our outreach of the vision and, um, and, and we will, um, the goal is to have a, a final plan um, in late next year, late 2021. Okay, moving um, down to Otay Mason, state round 11. Um, the project continues to make important binational uh, trades because that's the, um, that's the new port of entry, Otay Mesa East. Uh, two weeks ago, Sandag, Caltrans, District 11, and Mexican officials held a high level meeting to engage in policy and technical discussions addressing many of the various border issues. And these meetings are continuing. And the importance of these meetings is because at a high level, both, both organizations or both um, levels of government are, um, are getting very much on the same page. And so that's very critical in the success of Otay Mesa East. Uh, further north, the um, I-15 SR-78 managed lanes direct connector uh, project is uh, some of you might recall that Gustavo Delarda, who's the Caltrans District 11 director, he announced last week at our transportation committee that Caltrans, in partnership with Sandag and the city of San Marcos, released what's called a notice of preparation, an NOP, for the 15 and 78 managed lanes direct connector project. And this is an NOP is where the public can weigh in on what they want to see in, in the project's environmental document. Um, the proposed project would build managed lanes direct connectors between the existing I-15 express lanes and approximately three miles of new managed lanes on SR-78. It will also construct operational and access improvements on 78 and several San Marcos interchange, interchanges and roads. Uh, the NOP um, kicked off a 30-day public scoping comment period that's currently open until November 20th. Um, and the project team hosted a successful virtual public scoping meeting um, last Thursday, October 29th. And there's a virtual engagement hub where people can provide their feedback online on an interactive uh, project map. And if you'd like more information, of course, we can get that information to you. Um, the Midcoast Trolley project continues on time and, and on budget. Not that the project doesn't have its struggles. Uh, never worked on a $2 billion project that didn't have its struggles. So yes, we have our struggles, but we're on time and, and within budget. Um, we're meeting with, um, we continue meeting with all of the project partners, um, UC San Diego, MTS, Caltrans, and our next quarterly meeting is, um, is in December. Um, and, and I can tell you the project team is excited because in, in a little more than one year from now, we're gonna be celebrating the opening of this, the Midcoast Trolley being the region's largest ever um, infrastructure a smaller version of that or a smaller sub-project of that opened last week. Uh, Sandag and Caltrans announced the completion of the new um, southbound auxiliary lane um, along I-5 between Genesee Avenue and La Jolla Village Drive. Um, it allows motorists to enter the freeway from Genesee Avenue heading southbound and, and continue directly to La Jolla Village Drive off-ramp without having to merge with traffic. At least it gives them more time to merge with traffic, assuming they do. Um, the Del Mar Bluffs, um, it's, it's hard to believe what's happened in one year in the Del Mar Bluffs. And construction is, is, is wrapping up on what we call Bluffs 4. 
and we're working on the permitting process for Bluffs 5. Um, and this is uh, four or five of six projects that, that, that will um, secure the bluffs now going forward and stabilize them. And um, the, bluff, the bluff failure that triggered all this um, activity um, happened just last Thanksgiving, so less than, uh, less than 12 months ago. And so we've not only repaired those areas that, that failed, but we've completed another phase of the stabilization efforts and we've secured about half of the needed $100 million for the completion of uh, phases five and six just this year alone. And we hope to hear from the, the CTC, the Transportation Commission, uh, later this year on an additional uh, 30, a little over $36 million. So Chair Kenny, that concludes my report. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Linthicum. Uh, we'll take it up to the committee for discussion. Any questions from Mr. Linthicum? Okay. Scrolling through everybody's picture Jim, here. Jim Brad Barnum. Mr. Barnum. Um, the uh, auxiliary lane, uh, the La Jolla southbound there, that I've asked this question last year. The all the construction materials that have been laid down there, it's just piles of piles of uh, debris from the mid coast, I believe, right there when you turn off that exit. What's the word with getting rid of all that? Well, generally, what the contractors do is they stockpile that and, and recycle as much as they can. Um, what they can't recycle. They have to they have to dispose of some way, um, and so I'm guessing that since almost almost all of the earthwork and the grading and all that has been has been completed, they are probably looking to recycle that on, on other jobs working with contractors. Um, I can I can find out if you like what what the plans are for that. Um, but yeah, one time I can't picture the stockpile today because I'm usually looking up, up at the bridge when I drive. I just uh, I took that exit. Um, but you know, I can find out what. I took that exit the other day, Jim, and. Uh, okay, it, uh, I have a poor connection. My computer just told me. I don't... Can you hear me now? Yes. I just uh, I took that exit the other day, and it's a real narrow, really narrow exit. I'm surprised not many people. It, it's really tight and a sharp right turn there, and it's just a. A mess there. I'm just curious. It's just been sitting there for so long. John Haggerty is is on the line. John, can do you have anything to add? Yeah. Yes. Um, let me unmute my video for a second. Uh, but yes, uh, I actually asked that question of the contractor last time I was out there, and they say that they're going to use all of the material in there. That's where they've been crushing the concrete. So they right now intend to use it all on the project. Um, so I did question them about that and some other issues I had concerns with. Um, but yeah, they'll be using all that material um, and hopefully it won't be that much longer that we have all of those uh, uh, K-Rail up on that uh, right-hand exit off that new auxiliary lane. Well, it looks like a good project. I was just curious about that spot there. So thank you. Yes, sir. Any other questions from uh, the committee members for Jim? Hearing none, I'd like to thank you for your presentation today. It's always exciting to hear about the work that's going on. And on time and under budget always sticks out in my mind. So good job. Buddy. <laughs> so with that, we'll move on to the consent calendar portion of the of the agenda. There are four items on consents. Uh, I'm sorry, it's Tessa. I just want to state for the record that there were no public comments requested for item number three. Thank you for doing that. I will, I'll bear that in mind. Call for public comments. All right, with that, we're gonna move on to the consent calendar. We have an opportunity to take these all at once, uh, at least the first two information only, the second uh, two, six, item six and seven are asking for our approval. Is there any, uh, any desire from committee members to pull an item for discussion? Hearing none, uh, we will go ahead and receive items four and five and file them. Thank you, staff, for your effort in putting those together. Uh, items six and seven are our revised ITOC meeting calendar. I believe we're picking up a meeting in, on December 9th. Uh, and, um, and a, a meeting calendar update as well. Is there any desire on or any comments from the committee members or desire to pull these items from consent? 
Hearing none, seeing none, I'll entertain a motion for item six, the 2020 ITOC meeting calendar. I move to approve, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Uh, did I just fail to ask for public comment on Thank these you. items yes. as well? Yes, Sarah Kenny, you do need to ask for public comments before you vote on this item. Thank you. Uh, Tessa, are there any members of the public who would like to speak on this item? I do not see any hands raised at this time. Thank you very much. We have a we have a motion on the floor. We're looking for a second. Second. Tessa, if you could call for the vote on item number six. Could the uh, maker of the second please state their name? Sorry, Stuart Halpern. Thank you. I, I didn't catch it. I just wanted to make sure. So on the consent agenda, Chair Michael Kennedy. Well, just hang on a minute, point of order. So we're going to uh, vote on six and seven. We've been asked to approve those. And I think the motion was just for item six. So we're not taking the consent calendar in its entirety, but perhaps that would be, uh, uh, so let's just take items uh, six and then we'll have another vote on seven. My motion was for both because they're part of uh, consent. Oh, that? good. Thank you for clarifying. So the motion is for approval of items six and seven. I uh, misunderstood uh, and I vote to approve. Thank you. And Vice Chair Sunny House. Approved. Mr. Brad Barnum. Approved. Mr. Dustin Furler is absent. Mr. Stuart Halpern. Approve. Mr. Les Hopper. Approve. And Mr. Jeff Snyder is absent. Consent agenda items six and seven are passed with those members present. All right, thank you for that. We will see everybody on December 9th. That takes us to the reports section of the agenda and item number eight, uh, it's an information only item. Uh, Ariana, do you wanna make some quick comments on item number eight? Yes, happy to do so, Chair Kenny. Uh, I have a very quick update since it's only been a couple of weeks since your last meeting. Just one update that the board approved the Transnet early, sorry, environmental mitigation program work plan and annual funding for fiscal years, uh, well, the work plan for fiscal year 21, 22, and then the annual funding for FY21. And you saw that at your last meeting. And that's the only update I have for you today. Well, thank you very much. Tessa, are there any members from the public who would like to speak on item number eight? Thank you, Chair Kenny. I do not see any hands raised at this time. Thank you. We'll take it back to committee. Are there any questions for uh, Mr. Needham on item number eight? Let me scroll through my, my hand. I don't see anybody's hands up. All right. Thank Sorry, you very Chair. much. Stuart Halpern yes. has his hand raised. How do you know that? I saw him in his picture. <laughs> Raise his hand. All right, All right. I apologize. Uh, Stuart, I'm sorry for that. Go ahead, please. Not, not a problem. Thank you. Um, hey, Ariana, I was wondering, you know, I've forgotten. Could you refresh our memories? Um, when there's uh, elections, as we've just had, um, could you refresh your memories as to to what extent that means changes for the composition of the Sandag board when we head into the new year and people take offices or how does that work in terms of, you know, which constituencies, um, how they decide, you know, who their representatives are, county and localities, et cetera. Is there, is there sort of an easy way to summarize that? Yeah, I'll do my best. And then I'm sure someone will jump in if I don't do a good job of it, but yes. Yeah, so, uh, so my understanding is it's up to the local jurisdiction to decide tied in terms of appointments to the SANDAG board. So we will probably see some changes and that typically happens uh, in the first couple months of the calendar year. So that is when you would start to see the changes happening. You know, that gives the city council some time to, to make that uh, appointment. Um, I don't know if that helps answer the question. 
Gotcha. And similar thing happens, happens with the county where the board of supervisors get together and they decide who the representatives will be at the beginning of the new year. That's correct. Yes. And then Sandag is notified and then, um, and then that takes effect, like I said, at the beginning of the year. Got it. And then the board has its own process for determining its officers of the Sandag board, right? Yes. And I believe that process has started. There's um, a nomination process. So there's typically a, a committee, I believe, a uh, nomination committee that is established and, and members are then uh, encouraged to submit applications uh, based on their interest in serving. And, and then the board makes a decision. I'm not sure the timing of that exactly, if it is uh, after the start of the year. I, I think it's before the end of the calendar year, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, yeah, can you help me with that? Yes. So, on or about July of each year, we send out a request um, for nominations for applications for the open positions. And we close that after 30 days. And uh, last month's board meeting, the chair announced the nominations committee, which will meet between now and November meeting of the board. And then um, the, um, the, the nominations committee reports out to the board, and then we usually hold the elections by the end of the calendar year in December. There may be some delays this year just due to the results of the election. Gotcha, thank you. And then again, just out of curiosity, is that something that could end up being subject to weighted vote potentially as well, or is that not something where a weighted vote can be invoked? I think people will need to weigh in on that. John Kirk is on. I can, I can weigh in. The, uh, the election of Sandag leadership is, I think it is the only item for our operative statutes that is only done by a weighted vote. There is no tally vote in the election of board leadership. And that will um, typically happen sometime during the month of December considering both what is brought forth by the nominating committee as has been described, as well as potentially any nominations from the floor. And that's important because someone who was not in office at the time of nominations currently, but is in office in December would be eligible if they have been appointed by their jurisdiction at the time of the elections. Interesting, thank you very much. Appreciate the clarification. All right. Uh, thank you, Stuart. Are there any other members for uh, any other questions for staff from the committee members? Okay. Scrolling up and down, I don't see any hands raised. All right. Uh, this is an information only item. So I'd like to thank staff for their pres uh, presentation and we'll receive and file that item and we'll move on to item number nine. This is a, uh, an item related to the ITOC new member selection process. And we have a presentation by Ms. Barajas. Julie? Hi, thank you, Chair Kenny. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so our most recent real estate um, and right-of-way subject matter expert, Jeff uh, Schneider, recently informed us that he and his family will be leaving uh, the state of California. So unfortunately for us, means that we need to solicit uh, for his replacement. Um, staff has proposed that we have a slight variation because there are definite uh, costs associated with the full solicitation as well as the time that it takes uh, to seat a new member. Uh, we're proposing that we go back to the pool of applicants, uh, the most recent pool of applicants that we um, selected Jeff from, and we um, take those applicants, if they're still willing to move forward in this process, uh, to our technical committee, where they will uh, select two candidates and then advance them for further review by the selection committee. Um, we're hoping that the ITOC would, um, would approve this slight variation and allow us to move forward. Uh, we did, uh, review this option with our legal counsel. And uh, it was felt that if we could get approval from the full ITOC committee, um, that we would be able to move forward. So today we're asking for um, your approval. Thank you very much, Julie. Tessa, are there any members of the public who would like to speak on this item?
Tessa, I might be having audio problems, but could you could you check your mute? I for some reason I didn't unmute as quickly as I should have. There are no hands raised for item number nine. All right, thank you very much. So let me take it back to the committee. Do we have any questions for? Don't see any hand raised. I'm sorry, sir. Mr. Halpern is raising his hand again. I didn't get there fast enough. All right, Stuart. Yeah, sorry, I'll try to figure out how to do that um, hand raise functionality here, but <laughs> using the old fashioned visual. Um, so just if I could, for clarification, um, Julie, is it the case that the technical screening committee has already approved of or passed more than one other candidate at this point, so that we actually there actually are a couple of candidates that have been approved on a technical qualifications basis. So, in their last round, it was Jeff and one other applicant who were advanced to the selection committee. Uh, however, we were advised that we should go back to the full pool and have the technical committee once again review and then advance two more applicants to the selection committee. And again, um, just to make sure I'm understanding correctly, so it's not known whether <laughs> the technical qualification committee had said that the, let's call them the third or fourth or whoever weren't in the top two are qualified or not. They haven't opined on that or- I believe not? from what I can remember, there was, um, uh, there were some, um, differences in opinion who the two should be. So there was a third person I would say that they were considering. Um, however, the two most qualified were selected, which were Jeff and uh, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember the other person's name. That, that's okay. And um, I guess it just strikes me that it, to make a fully more fully informed vote, it would be nice to know that the technical screening committee had approved more that or thought more than just one other person was technically qualified. But um, I, I don't know that we can get an answer on that at this point. And maybe that just holds up the process. So hey, Mr. Chairman, can I can I provide a little bit more insight? Please, Mr. Nuncio. Um, so yes, when, when the uh, technical screening committee reviewed the, the applicants, I believe it was maybe four or five applicants uh, in total, and they did not necessarily go through a screening out process. It was more a review of all of the applicants and then a, a selection of what they considered the, the two that should be moved forward to the, um, to the selection committee. So. They did not go through any kind of a, a screening out process. I don't know if that answers your question. No, that's helpful. So then, and sorry to belabor this, but so then in effect, our vote today is to empower the technical screening committee to re-review that initial pool. And it's possible that they could come back to say that, you know, there really isn't more than the one other person. And if are we obligated to deliver two candidates to the board or is that not a requirement? Uh, well, as Julie mentioned, you know, when they, they were going through the, the review process, they were actually considering uh, more than two uh, as, be, you know, as potentially moving forward. But okay. because the, the essentially the, what we were asking from them was to select two, you know, they landed on, on two people. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I can add a little bit as well, if that's okay. I, I think that the, the pool was very well qualified. So there were a number of candidates that were, you know, had very impressive uh, credentials and were, were well qualified for the position, so. Okay, that, that's all I needed to know, thanks. Appreciate it. So I, I would move to approve if we haven't yet got a motion. Okay, we, we have a, a, a motion on the floor. Is there any other discussion or questions for staff? I have a comment, Mr. Chair. Vice Chair? Uh, I just want to make sure in considering all candidates that diversity for the ITOC committee is also considered. Uh, so I don't know who is has applied, if the uh, staff has made an effort to make sure that we have a diverse pool of candidates, but it would be nice to 
make sure that that happens. So. Okay. Julie, you're on mute. <laughs> There you go. So in the initial solicitation, we did make a concerted effort to reach out to lots of uh, groups, uh, including women um, and some community outreach, um, uh, lots of it uh, to hopefully get a good group of diverse candidates. So yes, we made that consideration. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Any other uh, comments for staff? Uh, Julie, uh, so long in, in historically when we've looked for candidates, how long have we held on to a, a resume pool before we were able to, to fill the position? What's say the longest time you went through this process? Well, it's it's uh, the uh, time that we take to search for candidates actually, um, we usually leave about a month to a month and a half of a solicitation period. And then from the time that the um, solicitation ends, we have 30 days. Uh, so we're on the clock basically to uh, go to the technical committee. And then we have another 30 days to advance those to the selection committee. So um, we always go back. Uh, and when that ends and a selection is made, we will always keep in mind those applicants. And we usually still have their information on hand so that for a future um, selection, we can go back and ask, hey, we have an opening, are you still interested? So, yeah. so the, the people that, that are going to be considered by, by the committee, when did they submit their application? Uh, I believe the period was February, it ended in February uh, earlier this year. Uh, no, I'm sorry, that was the first solicitation. We have two solicitations this past year. Um, the last one, I believe, what ended in July. In July. In July, yeah. What I was getting at is it, it doesn't seem like this is too far from the timeline that we typically would go through to get another candidate. It's just this gentleman didn't, wasn't able to serve for very long. So. Right. That was our, our thought behind this variation is that we just had a recent uh, solicitation process. So those applicants are still pretty fresh. And we'd like to, to be able to utilize them because as Ariana said, we had um, a pool of very high qualified uh, candidates. Thank you for that. All right, so we have a motion on the floor to approve from Mr. Halpern. Is there a second? I'd like to second. We have a second from Vice Chair House. Tessa, could we call for the vote please? Thank you. On item number nine, Chair Michael Kennedy. Kenny, I'm, par, I'm sorry. Approve. Vice Chair Sunny House. Approve. Mr. Brad Barnum. Approve. Mr. Dustin Fuller is absent. Mr. Stuart Halpern. Approve. And Mr. Les Hopper. Approve. Mr. Jeff Schneider is absent. Item number nine passes with those members present. All right, well, thank you very much, Tessa. With that, we'll move on to item number 10. This is a uh, information only item with a presentation on the vision for the 2021 regional plan. Okay, good morning and thank you chair and committee members for inviting me here today to present and discuss the details of the vision for the 2021 regional plan. Next slide. One of SANDAG's primary responsibilities is to develop a regional plan. It's a long-term blueprint for how our region will grow and how we'll get around. We update this plan every four years to account for factors like population change, economic growth, new laws, and technology trends. Next. We took a different approach this time, making this one of our most transformational updates ever. Our team has been working for the past 18 months using better and more detailed data than ever done before about where people are going and where they're coming from. Next slide. Our goal is clear. We must pass a regional plan that makes our transportation system faster, fairer, and cleaner. Faster by reducing traffic congestion, 
fairer by increasing social equity, and cleaner by meeting state and federal environmental requirements. And some of those state mandates are new, and they're one of the most important things that we have to keep in mind as we're developing this plan. Next. So we aim to address these issues with the five big moves, <clears throat> complete corridors, transit leap, mobility hubs, flexible fleets, and the next OS or operating system. There are five interreliant strategies that when they're linked together can connect our transportation system how we've never done it before in past plans. Next. And you can go ahead and go to the next slide as well. So <clears throat> some of the work that went into developing the concepts were providing as many opportunities as possible for the public to learn and provide input that's critical as part of the planning process. We've delivered hundreds of presentations and organized a number of workshops, webinars, partnered with um, our network of community-based organizations from across the region to conduct outreach to those vulnerable populations that are underserved and underrepresented. Next slide. And because we're planning for the future and technology is evolving <clears throat> incredibly quick, um, we assembled a panel of industry experts that consists of 11 Southern California industry leaders representing key sectors like wireless communications, clean um, technology, connected vehicles, data analytics, all of them coming together to provide input on technology solutions that we might offer in the plan. Next slide. So all of the public input and the data has helped us to shape the five big move concepts. And this is an illustration of how a typical highway could be transformed into a complete corridor, a, um, a, a roadway that creates space for all, for all modes and leverages technology to keep people and our goods moving throughout our region. Next. The full range of transit leap services are integrated <clears throat> with dedicated space on highways and local roads so that they can offer fast and reliable service. Next. Uh, similarly, <clears throat> the full range of flexible fleets are accommodated with dedicated space that's safe for those smaller micro mobility, as you can see in the image to the to the right, and HOV or carpool lanes that make rideshare micro transit more competitive when using our freeways. Next slide. The next OS or next operating system is making the system work by using data and technology to help us to manage how those lanes are used in real time, depending on how the demands and needs change throughout the day. Next slide. And the mobility hubs, they come in all shapes and sizes. This image here is a very large urban example, but at the core of all mobility hubs, regardless of their size, there are communities that have a range of travel choices coming together around our transit leap services. And they offer amenities that make it just easier and safer for people to get around. Next slide. And you can go ahead and go to the next one. <clears throat> A wide range of empirical data was also used to inform the, the vision development process. As we know, and you can see in these maps here, you know, 90% of what is here now will continue to be here in the foreseeable future. The map on the left shows you where people live within our region, the darker the color, the more concentration of the people. Uh, and the map on the right shows our top two tiers of employment centers throughout the region. Next. And we started with analyzing work trips, which tend to be the most predictable and they cause the greatest peak period of congestion and delay. A third of trips, all trips in our region are work related. And at the regional scale, you can see in the maps here, the blue dots, they represent the major employment centers that we talked about in the slide previously. The darker lines in the map on the left <clears throat> show all of the people from all over the region traveling to those jobs in those employment centers. And I know it's a lot of lines to look at and it's a lot of purple, but but when you look at the map on the right, we tried to simplify the map um, so that you can see where the greatest amount of commute trips are occurring. Next. So work trips aren't the only trips that people need to make. So we used anonymous cell phone data to do that same type of origin destination analysis for those non-work trips so that we can understand where people are coming from our border region and other populated popular destinations like Mission Bay, Balboa Park. These are areas that attract residents as well as visitors alike. Next. So our military bases were also an area that we looked at. We know that they are a major 
regional employment center that attract thousands of workers each day. And you can see on the map here that there's a significant number of trips that are happening um, going to and from our military bases. But the map on the right shows that when we combine all of the trips that we're, we showed in the images here, you can really start to see that a large portion of those trips are happening in the western third of our region and that a significant number of the trips are using our north-south corridors. Next slide. So as part of this plan, we also need to address the inequality in our transportation system as it relates to low income, minority and senior population and ensure that our residents all have equitable access. So today only 7% of our region's low income residents have access to fast and frequent transit. Next slide. 20% of our transit riders don't have access to a vehicle and they spend twice as long commuting via transit as people who drive. Next slide. And then 10% of our population is disabled, disabled. And many people with a disability have special transportation needs. And we've heard from them through our outreach that they're not really being met fully today. And our population, they're aging. 13% of the region's residents will be 75 or older by 2050. So we really need to be planning for a transportation system that will keep our seniors connected to their communities. So transportation is the largest contributor of greenhouse gas emissions that lead to climate change. If, if we ignore it, you can click through, there's two more images here. You know, temperatures and sea levels will continue to rise. And this means those longer, more intense heat waves that we experienced even this summer, you know, we're gonna have a greater risk of those devastating fires and floods. So all of this data and analysis went into developing the networks. And I'll start with discussing complete corridors. So next slide. So the vision includes a fully connected um, network of managed lanes and improvements to our rural roadways to streamline traffic in a more manage manageable way and to provide safe and equitable access to meeting daily needs. The managed lanes that we're envisioning for this regional plan could operate very similar to what many of you may have experienced if you've traveled on the I-15 express lanes. So this map that you see here shows that network of managed lanes and it consists of four managed lanes, two lanes in each direction. Um, that are, those are shown in the lime green. Shown in blue are three managed lanes where we can have a reversible lane during those peak hours. And then in purple are two managed lanes. And all of the managed lanes that we've proposed here match the needs of what we observed when looking at the data. And we also see the role of technology in helping us to manage our rural corridors, which are in the darker green there, um, because we do know that those are vital and it's vital for our, the residents in the eastern part of our county, as well as our tribal nations, and they serve as critical evacuation routes for them. Next slide. So I'm going to go through a few images throughout this presentation that show you kind of a before and after of when we implement some of the different five big moves. So this is an image of State Route 78. It's a typical freeway. It has three lanes in each direction and you can see the shoulders on the inside and outside. This is an illustration demonstrates how you could take a typical freeway and it could be transformed into that complete corridor, creating a space for all modes and really leveraging technology to help people in goods movement. You can see in the image there where there's wireless inductive infrastructure embedded into the roadways, helping us to facilitate the expansion of clean and electric vehicles. Next slide. And then with the use of technology, we can also manage how the lanes are used to better manage those peak hours, um, peak hour conditions and incidents. And as highlighted there in real time with those real time message boards, you can see that we're directing traffic left, something that you know, incidents and accidents often contribute to the worst congestion drivers experience on our freeways. So now I'm gonna talk about Transit Leap. So, our Envision Transit Leap Network includes a comprehensive system of commuter rail, light rail, and next generation rapid services to provide a better alternative for our region's residents in addition to our local bus and flexible fleets that I'll talk about later with flexible fleets. This is a network that provides fast and frequent service of 10 minutes or better, and it will be separated from congestion and in many cases offer travel times that could be comparable to driving. Next slide. So with this proposed network, we think that many residents will want to choose transit uh, over their car 
And if you click, there's going to be a series of clicks here that'll show the, the network. This purple here is the commuter rail system and the dark purple, it includes our low sand corridor, which we know is important for goods movement as well as um, passenger services. And the services are also aligned Primarily, these corridors are aligned with some of the greatest BMT and the longest trips. Shown in the pink is our existing light rail that could be improved with increased service bands, great separations to facilitate easier movement across our major roadways, as well as those higher frequencies. And there in the um, urban area downtown is a new tram service that could provide easier connections to our urban areas. And the, the teal color is our next generation rapid services that could be expanded. And if we're given priority treatments, they can offer faster and more reliable travel. This could be from dedicated lanes, connections to smart signals to minimize long waits at intersections and higher end transit vehicles that um, offer more comfortable you know, ride for people and makes boarding faster and easier. And the network also includes the special projects such as the connection to the airport, airport via a uh, people mover from the central mobility hub. The dotted line also shows um, down the 15 and going into downtown high speed rail service that connects from areas outside the region and possibly a new east west line across Palomar Airport Road uh, for regional connections to high speed rail when that does occur. Next slide. So here is an example of the San Ysidro Intermodal Transportation Center today down at the border. It's limited in space and it certainly um, lacks amenities for people waiting across. Next image. This image is if we were to take San Ysidro and make it into a mobility hub in the future. It could be a rich blend of local buses, micro mobility, and amenities that really just make it a, a really great place to catch a ride or wait when you're, before you're crossing the border. Next image. This is also an image of San Ysidro at the trolley stations platform today. And here's an image where if we were to put the high speed commuter um, service, it could provide better connections and really improve access to our border. And you can imagine what it could look like with a commuter rail operating right beside our light rail, as well as if we were to have high intensity land uses surrounding it. So now I'm going to talk about mobility hubs and mobility hubs are really, they work best in places with the high concentration of people, destinations and travel choices and really mobility hubs essentially do two things. They help people seamlessly get to and from transit leave services and they make it easier than ever to do shorter trips without having to necessarily have a personal vehicle. Next slide. So the proposed network here could be comprised of our region's urban core plus 30 more mobility hubs, all co-located with Transit Leap to serve many employment as well as recreational densities, uh, destinations. And there'll be a couple of clicks so that you can see all of the various uh, mobility hubs th throughout. So if you'll go ahead and do the next click, um, it highlights our urban, urban core. And then the next click, we have four gateway hubs that could be key entry points into our region and to getting access into the five big moves network. Next click, nine major employment centers that could offer mixed use development opportunities. And then eight coastal hubs improving access to our popular seaside destinations. And then nine suburban, mostly residential neighborhoods situated uh, near transit leap routes. And all of these mobility hubs really offer the highest concentration of transit leap, flexible fleet services, and everything from next generation rapid to e-bikes. So I've talked a little about Central Mobility Hub. Um, so I'll show you a, a couple of images of what that looks like closer. This is our Central Mobility Hub um, in this image here. And it could be a key convergence point where all types of tran transit services from across the region come together to provide connections. It could finally offer that direct connection to the airport that we've all been wanting, no matter where you're coming to or from uh, within the region. And so if you click on the, do a couple of clicks, I think it will show you some of the commuter rail services as well as, maybe, and some of the improvements to our, our highways, bikes, and transit routes, really giving you a good sense of how much services could come into a proposed central mobility hub. Next slide. 
So this is a, a iconic image just for you to take a moment to imagine what it could be like having our own grand central type of experience. You know, we could have that chic architectural design, a variety of shopping and dining options if we were to have a, a central mobility hub. And outside you could connect and use a variety of services such as micro mobility or just hail a ride getting to and from your destinations. And then this is an image of what the platform at Central Mobility Hub could look like. Imagine a central connection where you could have light rail, commuter rail, as well as the importance of interregional rail all coming together for at this one hub. And as I said earlier, mobility hubs do come in all shapes and sizes. And so this is Oceanside Transit Center um, platform. This is one of our gateway mobility hubs existing today. And then this is what Mobility Hub Improvements could offer, a new type of waiting experience for those at Oceanside Transit Center by offering things like complimentary Wi-Fi, mobile device charging, or even a space for mobile retailers to sell snacks or, or other services on site. So this is Mission Avenue. It's just a few minutes east of the Oceanside Transit Center and it's already undergone some really great improvements um, today. It's just a five minute bike ride, 10 minute walk from OTC. So if you envision um, the five big moves, you can see Mission Avenue with a mix of autonomous shuttles, you know, a shared fleet of mopads or electric vehicle charging stations, mixed use development, all of this really working together to complete a mobility hub in the North County. And so now we'll, we'll talk about flexible fleets. So our research has helped us to identify five flexible fleet um, service types, micromobility, which includes low occupancy, low speed devices like bikes um, or e-bikes, ride hail services like Uber and Lyft, and then ride share services when we carpool or vanpool um, with others going to the same destination. And then microtransit, which includes on-demand shuttle services that provide share trips from door to door. And then the last category is last mile delivery, which we've seen a huge shift to online retail and deliveries in recent years, and particularly I'm sure many of us in the past few months. Uh, so these are the, the five service categories that we've identified for flexible fleets. Next slide. And because of the different services and vehicles that are available, flexible fleets, we envision being able to serve all types of communities from urban to rural areas. And these are a collection of images that just give you, so you can imagine what those might look like. Next slide. What you see here is a design of a micro transit vehicle of the future. And if, thank you, vehicles, um, will be accessible and they can feature many comfort amen amenities to ensure passenger safety and privacy is maintained. You can even see there a cleaning robot um, to regularly sanitize the vehicle, something that might be important and needed as we continue to make plans for the future. Next slide. So it's another um, image. This is Serena Valley. It's the region's largest employment center with more than 129,000 employees traveling here on a daily basis. And you could imagine this employment center if it's revitalized. It could have the high speed um, transit options that we talked about, you know, mixed use development. And really all of these things coming together could transform this area into a true multimodal community. Next slide. And imagine not only from that, but if you get closer, imagine the, the on-demand shuttles that could pick up people at the transit station and drop them off at the, really their employer's front door. And that's really the vision of what we could see happening in Serena Valley as a mobility hub. Next. So the last of the five big moves is technology and it's it makes the system you know, work better. And so the next operating system, it's a secure digital platform that uses data from a variety of sources to manage the transportation system and to deliver new applications and tools for both residents, operators, as well as for planners and policymakers. Next slide. So let's take a look at how the next operating system might work combined with the other five big moves and how it can improve the experience of a typical commuter. So this is Laura. She lives in Southeast San Diego with her family. She works at Sharp Hospital in Serena Valley and Laura and her husband have one car that they have to share. And next slide. So if you 
see here today, Laura, if she were to go on her app and understand what are her options for commuting and getting to her place of employment, she doesn't have many viable, many viable options. Um, if she's working at Sharp, Sharp Hospital and she's a medical assistant, her schedule is likely going to vary and she's going to sometimes have to work late nights or early morning when transit service isn't available to her. And being that her household owns one car, her husband often will need it for his own job and also for dropping off or picking up the kids. And if you click one more time, <clears throat> In the future, with the five big moves and the next operating system, we're hoping that Laura will have more choices and better information to really just make her life easier, something I'm sure we all would appreciate and would love to have. But let's assume that Laura picks transit as her choice. So if you'll click. And next slide. So if she clicks transit or selects transit, um, her son bikes to school now, if we have a next operating system and all of the five big moves in place, her son can bike to school now because there's a safe complete corridor uh, infrastructure in her neighborhood. Laura can get a notification on her next operating system app, letting her know that her son has safely arrived at school. Maybe she can take her daughter on the train and drop her off at daycare in a mobility hub because all of the, the land uses have changed and it allows that opportunity for her. Maybe she also has Wi-Fi on the train and she can order her groceries from her smartphone to be delivered to her mobility hub locker for her to grab on her way home. So that convenience and that kind of experience is what we want everyone to have access to in the future. Transportation choices that are affordable, easy to access, and just get you to where you need and want to go without the delays. Next slide. So the vision for the 2021 regional plan, it is a long-term investment in the region's future. It's been developed through analysis of data as well as input from the community. It's a network that includes a fully connected network of managed lanes, improvements to our rural corridors to ensure safe and equitable access to meeting the daily needs, a state-of-the-art high-speed transit system that provides a compelling option to driving that's convenient, safe, and affordable and gets people to where they need and want to go, commuter rail, light rail, as well as rapid services, and a network of mobility hub centers <laughs> centers of our community that would provide access to high-speed transit as well as multiple travel options and the deployment of flexible fleets that provide options for how we make those short trips within our community and get to the mobility hubs, giving people an option um, rather than having to own a car. And of course, all of this tied together with the next operating system, those technology improvements to ensure that we're making the most of our current as well as our future investments. All of these investments you can see here focused on the western part of our region, allowing us to preserve our open space and its environment. So this is the, reg uh, the vision for our region and for the vision for the 2021 regional plan. And that concludes my presentation. Wow. Uh, Ms. Fiola, that was great. That was great. That, uh, a lot of information there and a very good presentation. Thank you. Before I bring it back to committee, uh, let me check with the clerk. Do we have any members of the public that have any questions on this issue? Thank you, Chair. I do not see any hands raised for item number 10. Tessa, thank you very much. We'll take it back to committee. Do we, do we have any questions for the presenter? Oh, sure. I can. All right, well. I am, uh, there we go, Stuart. Thank you for raising your hand, sir. Mr. Halper. Thanks, um, great presentation. You know, one thing that um, comes up from time to time, um, you know, I see it in the press and, um, you know, people who know that I'm involved with Sanday, you know, sometimes ask me, I'm wondering if there's a way to just address the question about the, um, you know, the heavy, capital investment of some fixed rail things, tunnels, things like that for the people who would argue that, you know, technology and automated vehicles by themselves could really um, significantly add to the capacity of the current system. Is there a just sort of a summary way to address that question? Yeah, that's a good question. And so, you know, one, I'll answer and I'll give you a couple of things that I hope will help you in your 
talking to others about this. Um, so we have to put forward a plan that's going to meet, you know, state and federal mandates. And so part of that is that we, we have to not only reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, but as part of the CEQA process, we have to put forward projects that are multimodal in nature that will reduce the number of vehicles mild travel. And so putting options, transportation options, such as a transit system forward will help us in achieving those goals that are mandated by the state. So that that's one aspect. In terms of the automated vehicles, you know, we brought on our vision advisory panel, which are private industry, you know, um, experts to help us understand how technology is evolving and changing in that particular realm. And, you know, there's still a ways to go before we see all of the autonomous vehicles being part of the network. But again, looking at what we're mandated from the states, you know, and the federal government, we still need to work towards putting forward projects that reduce vehicle smiles travel. And there's the social equity perspective, because we, we have social equity that we have to keep in mind. Uh, it's required by the federal government through Title VI. And so assuming that the investment should be you know, more leaning in one direction or the other, we have to make sure that we're able to meet all of the Title VI requirements, which does require a balanced transportation system. Gotcha. Great. Thank you. Any other questions from the committee members? I got a couple. Um, it, for the, the next OS was the last presentation I had seen of the, the five uh, big moves. It seems to me that's going to have to go first because almost all of the other uh, components need to have some kind of communication system or, or processing platform. Aside from the, you know, the, the high level planning, is, are any of these five big moves ahead of the other? Uh, has there been any thought on, you know, how we structure one or the other? Yeah, we're currently working through the phasing of the five big moves from taking the vision into what becomes the plan. Um, and we do agree that there are parts of the technology being the, you know, the glue in a sense is going to really hold all of the five big moves together and gives us some of the greatest benefit. We see the technology aspect needing to put some of that forward um, early in the phasing. We haven't completed the phasing of the projects um, so that it's still more work to be done on determining that, but we agree that technology is going to be needed early on. Hmm. Okay. Uh, is there any part of the country where micromobility, particularly are thriving. We've kind of seen, you know, it's up and down in San Diego, but are there other parts of the country where they're, they're doing uh, or they're performing differently? Yeah, I mean, it, it really depends on where, you know, San Diego is, it, it has, I understand what you mean, it has its ups and downs. We saw the bikes come on the streets and then we saw them all go away. And um, certainly there's still a lot of movement and fluidity and the private sector's involvement in providing those micro services, micro mobility services. But we've seen success of that in Seattle is always a great example of where we see how micro mobility is very, um, it's doing very well. And when we talk about micromobility, um, we also have to keep in mind it's not only just the private sector's investments of what they're doing from a technology and, and innovative ways of putting transportation forward, but it's also we've seen the increase of e-bikes and personal um, ownership. And so that's also part of the micromobility conversation. More and more people are purchasing e-bikes, more people are purchasing bikes, and that's also where we need to consider um, accommodation for them on our streets and roads and how we, you know, encourage and give them safe access for moving around. So yes, there are other places. Seattle is one great example that you can look to. And I think it's also doing fairly well uh, to the north of us in the Los Angeles area. Good to note. Um, I, there was a slide that uh, you put up and showed the regional uh, freeway network. And there were three, I think there are east west freeways that were being considered for reversible lanes. Did I understand that? Yes. Yes. So we would, I'm sorry, go ahead and finish with your question. Specifically, how's that going to work on the 94? Is that like a event or? 
Yeah, so right now we're at the, the vision plan, the vision stage, and so we put forward, you know, a visionary concept. There's still a lot of work that would have to be done to actually determine the operations and the engineering of it. And Jim, who was on here earlier, knows very much about how all of the work and details that go into it. And so we're working closely with um, our partners, Caltrans, on, you know, this network and this vision. They've been a part of it with us. And so certainly they're there'll be the next stages that we'll have to go through before the plan can turn into projects. Well, from a big picture uh, approach, it does make sense to take your three smaller east-west freeways and add a ton of capacity to get people from residential to, to commercial. Well, this, is, uh, this is exciting stuff. And yeah. it's, it seems to be moving rapidly at you know little bits of it get presented to us every once in a while and there's it's available to us from other sources other uh, but I do appreciate you coming back and kind of uh, rounding out the current status of the five big moves that's uh, yeah and we'll be happy to come back um, you know I think we put in our report we'd be happy to come back to ITOC in the new year once we've gotten through our model it, it's quite a process that it has to go through to get um, you know through some of the results but we'll we'll happily come back and give an update on the next steps of information all right uh, one that oh uh, vice chair house uh, hi Twery. how much of this is within or compatible with the current transmit uh, ordinance, and then what's the plan for implementation for the rest of it? So I don't have the exact percentage, um, but certainly there, there are a lot of projects that are within the current transnet ordinance that are still there. I would say the biggest difference is probably what you would see on the highway projects, because there are a lot of projects that are just there in the current transnet ordinance. They're proposed in the vision slightly different. So for example, State Route 56, original, it was proposed as adding um, general purpose lanes, and we're proposing that we put those as managed lanes. So it's still adding capacity to those corridors. It's just adding capacity in a different way. Um, State Route 78 is another one. They have proposed one um, HOV lane, managed lane, and we're proposing, looking at the data, that there's actually a need for two HOV lanes in each direction. So that's, that's really where you see the difference. It's it's still understanding there's a need on those corridors, but it's identifying a different way to fulfill the need um, on them. So how does SANDAG plan to rectify the differences as to make you still meeting the uh, requirements of the ordinance? Yeah, we'll have more of that information um, coming forward later. Right now, we're still in the long range visionary process. And so we need to look at revenues and understand what exactly we're gonna be able to take from vision to plan. And when we have that information available, then we'll be able to share more about exactly how that impacts the transnet ordinance moving forward. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Brad, Les, any questions? Okay. Well, yes, uh, thank I'm, you I'm for good. the presentation. That was incredible. Always good to hear the latest. Yeah, that was a, an excellent presentation. So with that, thank you very much. We thank will, uh, as this uh, an information only item, we'll receive it and file it. And thank you for your good efforts. We'll move on to item number 11, which is the uh, fiscal year 2018 Transnet Triennial Performance Audit Update, and that will be provided by uh, Ms. Zernita. So, Ariana. Thank you, Chair Kenny. So, as you mentioned, this is an update on your FY18 Triennial Performance Audit implementation. And the last time that we presented an update was at your September meeting. And at that meeting, ITOC members established a subcommittee to work with staff on implementation efforts for the FY18 audit. And that subcommittee includes Chair Michael Kenny, Vice Chair Sunny House, and ITOC member Les Hopper. And since uh, the September meeting, we've, uh, as staff, we've implemented one additional recommendation that's noted in your report. That brings us to a total of 16 of 26 completed recommendations. And then in addition, since that meeting, the audit subcommittee has met twice. Staff provided an overview of all audit recommendations to the subcommittee and worked with uh, the subcommittee to change the format of the progress matrix, which is attachment one to your report. 
Some of the changes that you'll note include placing all open recommendations at the top of the report. We've added targeted and actual completion date columns. And then we also added a separate row to track next steps. And then the subcommittee also removed the previously shown ITOC member leads for each chapter because uh, the subcommittee is now taking the lead on working with staff on implementation. And then in terms of near term steps, uh, next steps, it's anticipated that a second presentation of the transportation performance framework will be provided at your December meeting. And that's expected to continue informing the completion, completion dates that we are showing for remaining items. And then in addition, at your December meeting, we're planning to provide a report to begin addressing recommendation number 23. That one calls for reporting on implementation of Transnet goals. And then the subcommittee is planning to meet again after those December presentations. And in the meantime, we're looking for any additional feedback that you might have today on the format of the matrix or on the implementation of the audit recommendations. Well, thank you very much. Before we take it back to committee, I'd like to check with the clerk. Do we have any members of the public who would like to speak on this issue? Thank you, Chair. I do not see any hands raised for item 11. Thank you, Tessa. Are there any questions for uh, Ariana from members of the committee? I don't see any. Does anybody else? Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, is there any discussion uh, uh, amongst the committee members about uh, uh, the item presented today? Uh, Sonny, we're on the committee. Anything we need to share with our other uh, committee members? Uh, I just want to thank uh, the staff for accommodating us and, and creating this new spreadsheet. I think it's just a lot easier to understand the progress. And, and you can see that Sandag has made quite a bit of progress in achieving you know, a lot of the completion. And uh, it looks like uh, there's one item, the performance um, matrix issue is what's gonna really, uh, I guess, trigger a lot of the rest of it that needs to be completed. So we're looking forward to see in that report uh, next month and to figuring out how we can move forward um, to in, in uh, completion of the rest of the items. So thank you, Julie, and thank you, Ariana, for doing that. Thank you, thank you. Stuart has a... All right, this is a uh, list, oh, I'm sorry, Stuart. Um, yeah, I would just say um, thanks also to the subcommittee. I mean, I think it's a great concept and I agree that it'll be very helpful. So I just want to appreciate, send appreciation to the folks on the subcommittee for working on this, putting us together. Thank you, Stuart. All right, Ariana, this is listed as a discussion item. Is there any action that staff was anticipating the committee to take? No, not at this time. All right, well, thank you very much for the presentation. We'll receive and file that and move on to our next item, which is item number 12, the quarterly finance report. And this is going to be presented by uh, Mr. Dojan and uh, Ms. Bouchard. So, Andre? Yeah, uh, good morning, Chair Kinney and members of the ITALK committee. So this is an informational item on the financial markets that we bring to the board and I talk on a quarterly basis. Uh, this report is based on the first quarter for 2021 or as of September 30th, 2020. So the prime report that we gave to you was as of June 30th and was presented to you at your September 9th meeting. So although we present our entire investment profile in these reports, the idea is just to focus on the changes since the prior quarter. And after me, uh, Stephanie will present an update on the state of the economy. So in general, this quarter was marked by notable recoveries after the economy broke a historic low last quarter. The stock market continued to rally in July and August with a slight pullback in September. And interest rates have firmed up after setting historic lows uh, back in the prior quarter. With no substantial changes to our debt portfolio of the last quarter, although I would say that staff is very busy working on several items that should positively impact our debt profile over the next couple quarters. Uh, the first is the refinancing of the TIFIA loan that I mentioned at the last meeting. 
This has gone to the TIFIA office, who's kind of accelerated the process now, and we expect to go to their credit committee next month. We are actually taking this item to the uh, transportation committee and board for approval this month. And based on where the 30 year treasury is right now, the 1.5% range versus where we locked in our rate at 2.72% uh, over three years ago, we expect that should have savings of approximately 100 to $150 million for us. We also continue on the path of refinancing our 2014 bonds and our 2018 bands or our bond anticipation notes. In fact, just yesterday, we received 15 responses from investment banking firms hoping to assist us on, our ref on these refinancings. Um, based on where current interest rates are today, uh, we expect approximately $25 million of savings on the 2014 refinance and $10 million or so on the bands for a potential savings approximately $35 million. And we expect to close these transactions um, early quarter, uh, first quarter of next year. In addition, we are currently looking at releasing the uh, debt service reserve fund from the 2008 bonds, which should be uh, releasing about $17 million, which can be used for uh, ongoing projects that we have. Uh, looking at our investments, currently the quarter we ended approximately $1.1 billion, uh, yielding 0.74%. Unfortunately, that's lower than the prior quarter of 1.16%, but that's not a surprise based on the action that the Federal Reserve took uh, in the early part of March and April when they basically cut interest rates to 0% to 0.25% based on the uh, pandemic that we're in. Now, last month, you'll recall that Jose uh, uh, Ray uh, Major, your chief economist and I presented on the sales tax collections and the challenges that we've had with the CDTFA. Uh, we had projected this year overall to be down about 6%. Our October numbers just came in and based on where the numbers are showing us right now, we're up 4% for the year. Now we know that that is going to be adjusted downwards in November when we get the sales tax update. We know that there's going to be some adjustments in there. So once that adjustment comes in in November, I think we'll have a better feel for what the rest of the year will look like. In fact, that's why we have that additional December 9th meeting to kind of discuss uh, where we are uh, with our sales tax revenues and what we would expect uh, for the rest of the year and kind of update you on the plan of finance as well. So hopefully once we get the uh, November number with the adjustment, we'll have a better feel for uh, the rest of the year. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Stephanie who will kind of give you an update on the economy. Thank you, Andre. Stephanie, if you could check your microphone, please. See if you're on mute. I can barely hear you. Stephanie, maybe it's your volume. Uh, Kendall, is there an option for Stephanie to perhaps dial in via her phone? Is that something we would want her to do if she can hear us? She can. Um, Stephanie, it looks like you almost turned the volume down, um, but your uh, your audio option at the bottom of Zoom has like a little uh, carrot that brings open a, a box. You want to check your audio settings there. It should show you that perhaps it is low. It's turned down. You would use a pull bar to uh, to, to pull it the whole way back up. Um, but otherwise, I can send. Can you hear me better? Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It was automatically adjusting. I guess it didn't like my voice. I don't know. So I <laughs> I unticked the automatically adjust. So it's a good tip to know. Um, thank you. So hi, everyone. So um, this is going to be a quick update on the economic situation both in the US and San Diego and you know unfortunately since we talked two months ago nothing much has changed um, so if you look at the US overall 
Uh, so we had a contraction in GDP in the second quarter of the year, and then there was a rebound. And the data was released last Friday, plus 33%. Um, that's a record increase from one quarter to the next. However, if you look at the chart on the upper left, what you can see is even with this 33% um, increase, we are still way below where we were before the COVID. So there is still, still a long way um, for the economy to go back where it was before and even longer way to go back to the trend that would have occurred without this crisis. So for now, I mean, I, you know, we track the national forecast. Uh, so we track several forecasters and for now the consensus was around minus four for 2020, which is better than a few months ago. Um, and 3.7% for 2021 for the GDP growth in the US. The most recent updates and what we can read is that people are getting more and more concerned that the recovery has stalled in the US and some people are even saying that uh, there may be some kind of reversal in the favorable trends we observe up to now. So most likely the forecast for 2020 is not gonna change that much because we already, we already know three quarters of the year but the forecast for 2021 may be revised down uh, given the not so good economic news and the not so good news on the health front. Uh, however, you know, the day there is a vaccine, everyone would be very optimistic and then you will see the forecast going up. But for the meantime, I think we can expect some downward revision to the forecast. Um, so on the employment situation, we still uh, look at the weekly unemployment claims. And uh, although the situation is not as bad as it was uh, in the month of April and May, we still have uh, 700,000 people almost feeling for unemployment benefits every week. Uh, of course, some people are going back to work at the same time, but this is still a very exceptional situation. Uh, last on income and consumption, I think it's something I already presented last time. What you can see, I mean, the purple is the disposable income. So what the money that's available for people to spend and you know, despite the increase in unemployment, all these job losses, there was an increase in income at the beginning of the pandemic. So you can see it in April, May, and this is due to the very generous unemployment benefits and the stimulus checks. However, you know, these gains have been faded over time, uh, despite the improvement on the labor market front. And uh, if there is no further stimulus it's likely that we would see some potential contraction in income. And this is not gonna be good for consumption. Consumption was uh, very strongly affected by this crisis. Uh, it has rebounded, but now what we can see is that the rebound is kind of conditional to what is going to happen on the income front. Moving to San Diego. Ah, can you go to the next slide? Sorry, I thought I was, yeah. Okay, so uh, it's a bit of the same story for the San Diego economy. So there is still a long way to go. And the way I think about it is that, you know, the low hanging fruits have been picked, uh, but we are kind of stuck midway. And, you know, if, if you think of the fruit metaphor, I mean, the harvest is gonna be very long and um, we still, uh, it's <coughs> there are still several issues. Uh, if you look at the employment situation, I compared on the on the left upper chart the what has happened between the uh, last two big recession, like the ninety one recession and the Great Recession, and what's happened now. So it, you know the the decline was sharp. There has been a strong re rebound over the past few months, but we are still in a worse situation than we were at the worst of the Great Recession. In, it's the Great Recession starting in 2008. And if you remember, the worst for unemployment was around 2010. And we are worse than we were in 2010. And, um, you know, it's going to take some time to go back. Uh, one thing that I found interesting and that I didn't present last time is some insights from the 
census survey on small businesses. This is something that the census has started uh, end of April to see what was happening on the small business sectors. And what I find quite interesting is if you look at the, so it's a bit of a complicated chart, but uh, the, the dashed bars, uh, they represent what small businesses thought was going to happen early May. And so 8% said that there was no effect of this pandemic. And you had like 18% thinking that they would have recovered within two to three months and 30% that they would have recovered between four to six months. Uh, and the, the plain bar show you what is the situation now. And what we can see is basically a kind of a divide. So some of them have already recovered. The one that were able to recover in this environment uh, from this survey, we can uh, we, we can think that they have recovered. So the, the number of companies that say that there is no if impact or that they went back to normal is like it's 26%, so about a quarter. Very few now expect to be recovered in two to three months, so by the end of the year, and not so many between four to six months. And there is a, a much larger number, like about half that on the, don't expect to go back to pre-COVID level of operation uh, within the next six months. So it's like the one that could recover, have recovered, and the other one, they are not expecting anything to change between uh, for the next six months, which is kind of a bit worrying. Um, but this is very much linked to the health situation. And I guess it means that they don't expect the vaccine to be fully developed by the next six months, which means that they can't go back to a normal level of activity. Some other data that we are <clears throat> tracking, uh, you know, it's the, the mobility data and the credit card spending. I presented this chart last time. And as you can see, I mean, there is some small improvement, but they, I mean, the line, they seem flat since the end of August, both in terms of mobility and in terms of spending, there has been some small improvement, but I mean, we can't, we can't call victory there. Uh, so we are still about 10 to 20% below, below normal. Um, so this is why, this, this is why I, I think that we are, uh, this recovery is going to be long and we need to wait until we, we get a vaccine to really see things improving. Uh, I presented this dashboard, if you can go to the next slide in the past, and it kind of tells the same story. Uh, so the, you know, the purple line is our previous meeting. Uh, so last time I presented everything up to the purple line and if anyone was not there at the meeting and asked some question, I can re-explain this dashboard. But basically, you know, just before the purple line and just after the purple line, you don't see major changes. You don't see many categories going, going back to green. Um, so, you know, that's the current situation. And um, as I said earlier, the main message is, you know, the low hanging, the low hanging fruits have been picked, but uh, it's going to take some time to reach the other ones. So thank you, and uh, let me know if you have any questions. Ms. Kishar, thank you very much. Uh, before we take it to committee, let me check with the clerk. Tessa, are there many, any members of the public who would like to speak on this issue? Thank you, Chair Kenny. There are no hands raised on this item. Thank you very much. We'll take it to committee. Are there any questions from the committee members for our presenters? Stuart, I see your hand up. Yes, thank you. Um, Stephanie, I always appreciate this presentation. I'm wondering if you could um, just review again, because you may have touched on it uh, or perhaps elaborate on, you know, how do you sort of, uh, how do you model the unknowns relating to um, activity uh, given the potential for you know, there to be a second wave and that sort of thing. Because um, it seems like there are a couple of 
key questions, right? One is the degree to which there is a second wave. Secondly, the severity. Thirdly, timing of vaccine. And then on top of that, the question of, you know, when the vaccine is widely available, how many people are willing to get vaccinated? Could you maybe just walk through a little bit as to how you use those different dimensions and modeling things out, whether it's for a base case or sensitivities around a base case? So, um, you know, since we are waiting to make sure that we know what's our starting point for uh, our transnet revenue, we haven't put yet together, you know, the full forecast because I, I really need to know where, where I start from. So that, that's the main issue we are facing right now. And once we have this, uh, we're gonna use the same approach we used in April, which was to look at different scenarios. So this is gonna be a completely different set of scenarios. Instead of thinking it's gonna be a two month, three months, six months, you know, remember the previous approach, like it could be two months lockdown, three months lockdown, four months lockdown, we're gonna be, precisely building these scenarios with different assumptions. And you know, at this point in time, we can only have scenarios and assumptions. And these key assumptions are gonna be, when do you get a vaccine and when is it widely available? Because I don't think the economy can go back to normal before that. And uh, once we have the vaccine assumption, then we're gonna have several assumptions on how much it takes you to go back to normal once you have the vaccine, you know, and uh, some sectors may react differently. And uh, so we my the, the approach we're gonna, we're gonna have is to present different scenarios. And then of course, we're gonna need, a, you know, the baseline, the one we believe the most in. Uh, so this is gonna be our baseline. And I can't tell you right now, because I'm so happy I have one more month to think about it. Uh, you know, but there are, there are surveys, for instance, there are surveys among professionals on when can be, when can a vaccine be fully available. For now, I think the consensus is at the end of the first quarter of next year. Personally, I would find it a bit optimistic. Um, so, but we look again at this data and then we'll have to make some assumptions on, you know, you will see all the different scenarios and you will see the one for now we consider as being the main one. At the same time, you will always back up our baseline forecast with what the others are saying. So we're gonna keep on monitoring you know, the national forecast and also the few forecasters that are doing a San Diego forecast. So we can assess uh, how far we are from, from the others. And uh, this, is, this is gonna be our approach going forward. There is another big uncertainty as I mentioned, is, uh, how households are going to be supported between now and the Stephanie, if you can, if you can hear us, we're we're not uh, hearing you at the moment. You're back. We lost the ending of what you were saying. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So I was saying one of the main factors is going to be what happens with the stimulus package. Going forward, uh, income support is going to be key between now and the time we have a vaccine fully available. Um, but given that we still don't know uh, the election results and how, you know, uh, it's very difficult to tell what's going to be the fiscal and policy going forward. So I hope that in the months we know for sure, you know, the political situation in the country and the most likely scenario in terms of supporting household income. Great, thank you. And just one follow up if I could. Um, you know, be, because the modeling of taking into account the uh, various possible uh, ways this could go with the um, with COVID-19 is not your normal modeling and it, there's complexities and it's kind of new for everybody. 
I'm wondering if just in terms of the process for modeling things, um, you know, in the plan of excellence, we talked about the notion of using uh, sort of outside experts to sort of provide external validation for assumptions and, and things of that nature. Would just even the methodology for trying to model out the potential impacts as we get further into the COVID crisis, um, will that itself be something that you're going to be seeking outside opinions on in terms of just validating the way that you're modeling that? Uh, that's something we haven't been discussing so far. Uh, the, the main issue is, as you said, everyone is in the dark. So you're going to put 10 economists in the same room and no one is going to agree on the starting point, the modeling approach, but uh, that's something we can think about. And yeah, I mean, that that's a good suggestion. We need to see how practical this can be done in the current environment. And, uh, but again, to start any process, we really need to know where we are because even the modeling approach is completely different. You know, if transnet revenues haven't declined with this crisis, it's a completely different situation than if we have lost 10% of our revenue. I mean, it's a completely different approach. So we, we really need to know where we are before uh, we, we even put a process together. Great, thanks. I, you know, I don't have any doubt that you guys left to your own devices probably would come up with the you know, nation's leading best methodology for doing it. Um, but having said that, because it is so new for everybody and there are just so many just different, almost non-economics oriented factors here that are out of the ordinary, it would probably be comforting if, um, you know, when you bring this back, not just to us, to the board, what have you, if you're also able to say that we did some external um, sort of reasonableness testing in terms of the approach to this, but thanks, appreciate yep. the presentation. All right, do, do we have any other questions for staff from committee? I'm not seeing any hands up. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, always a uh, good presentation. As it's an information only item, we'll, we'll receive and file it. And uh, thanks again. With that, we'll move on to item number 13 of the uh, 2020 Transnet Major Corridors and Bikeway Program Project Status Report. Ms. Gonzalez. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. So a little background first on these reports. So during the fiscal year 2015 Transnet Triennial Performance Audit, some recommendations were provided to better enhance project management practices and to improve performance monitoring and reporting for the major corridors and regional bikeway programs. So in response to those audit recommendations, SANDAG staff developed the annual Transnet Project Status Reports in fiscal year 2017. Now these reports monitor annual performance metrics such as projects delivered on schedule, projects delivered on budget, contract award value against engineers estimates, and bikeway miles constructed. So today we will be reviewing the key data points for the FY20 status report updates, which would be the fourth iteration of these reports. And data captured in these reports will be through the end of fiscal year 20, so as of June 30th, 2020. So we'll go ahead and begin with the major quarters report. Um, Ariana, can you bring that up on the screen? Thank you very much. So the first metric that we summarize on uh, this report is the amount of transnet funds versus the amount of outside funds leveraged from state, federal, and local sources. So this captures the total program funding for projects in the FY20 budget, as well as any projects that have been closed out prior to that budget cycle. So at the end of FY20, Transnet funds represented 30% of the overall program funding, which means that 70% of the funding was being leveraged from federal, state, and local sources. So the ordinance requires a 50% leveraging from outside sources, so we are exceeding that goal. And then if we move down a little bit, the next section is the uh, annual schedule milestone attainment. So we monitor in particular uh, projects advertised to the construction community, as well as projects open to the public. 
So in fiscal year 20, 100% of the advertising milestones planned for the major quarters program were accomplished. And in terms of open to public milestones, uh, we reached 50% of the milestones. However, I will caveat that with, uh, there were only two planned milestones. So really this only represents one missed milestone. And if we move down to the second page of the report, the next section that you'll see is the support to capital ratio section. So this represents the ratio of support budgets as a percentage of the total construction capital cost. Now we separate this data based on three categories. So projects less than $30 million, projects between 30 to $100 million, and then those projects $100 million or more. So while the median support to capital ratio increased by 6% overall for projects 30 to 100 million, the ratios have remained unchanged for projects less than 30 million and then those above 100 million. So overall, um, pretty consistent with prior years. And the next metric that we display is the variance between awarded construction contracts and engineers estimates. Um, this only captures traditional design bid build projects so there were no design bid build contracts awarded for the major quarters program in FY20. So that's why you don't see any new data in the FY20 column. Um, however, I did wanna point out that we did award two construction manager general contractor contracts in FY20. Um, but again, this is just to reflect traditional design bid build. And then next, uh, the metric is total budget variance. So this is the variance between the total budget just before construction began versus the total budget or cost at closeout. So the actual total cost of the three projects that we closed out in fiscal year 20 was 34% lower than the budget at the start of construction. Now, this may seem kind of large, but this is mostly due to the transfer of project scope and funds within the same corridor for two of our CIPs. So I'll give you a little bit more detail on those. So the first of those was our Southline rail freight capacity project. And um, for this project in fiscal year 14, we removed um, the positive train control scope from the project, which reduced the budget by $56 million of TCIF funds. Now these funds weren't lost, but they were moved within other CIPs in the goods movement corridor. Um, and these changes were coordinated with MTS and NCTD. So um, the scope was essentially taken care of under other projects and funds transferred within. So again, it results in a large variance, but it doesn't mean the funds were lost or scope was lost. And the second project where we saw a large uh, variance between pre-construction total budget and then at closeout was our I-15 Express Lanes North segment. And this project, the first phase of construction began in fiscal year nine, so over a decade ago. And so that was kind of one of the original CIPs in the I-15 corridor that we broke off different construction packages um, and moved funds from this CIP onto new CIPs. So for example, um, just a year after construction began for this CIP, we transferred $30 million of transnet funds to begin the I-15 Mira Mesa DAR project. And there were also a handful of other projects that we kind of had shifted money onto um, as the years went by. So ultimately these funds were moved between CIPs um, to create efficiencies in project delivery, not because of a loss of scope. And then the last section you'll see is the construction budget variance. And this differs in that this represents the variance between only the planned construction budget versus the actual cost of construction. So again, you see the variance here of 35%. And again, for the same reasons as we previously mentioned, um, this is due to movement of funds within the corridors, not because of a loss of scope. So I'll pause there if there's any questions on that report right now before I move on to the bikeway report. Uh, well, thank you, excellent presentation so far. Any questions up to this point? Hearing none. Okay. Uh, <laughs> oh, I'm yeah. sorry, Les, do you have your hand up? I had to do the steward method because I couldn't find the raise my hand on the chat bar. <laughs> so went to all right. um, Thank you, Chelsea. And I just had one question. You had mentioned that there were two CMGC projects awarded in 2020. What were those? Oh, let me grab that for you. So those were our, it was our, uh, one of our border access projects. So the, uh, let's see here, the, 
Okay, actually, let me pardon me. There are two of our I-5 projects. So the first being our Voight Drive improvements, and the second being our I-5 Genesee Ox Lane. So since those are taken care of under the I-5 corridor, that's why those were awarded through CMGC contracts. Got it. Thank you. I, I just couldn't think what they were, but that makes sense. No problem. Okay. We'll move on then to the bikeway corridor report. Uh, Ms. Gonzalez, hold on a second here. Uh, Vice Chair House. Chelsea, yes. uh, since the uh, change in scope and claims and things like that skews this finding, if you take that out, what is the outcome? If, if the change in scope is you know, taken out of the way, are you guys within budget or uh, how are the costs versus uh, your estimates? Yeah, I would say that I probably have to look at the exact numbers, but I would say we would be within the budget because um, money for both of those CIPs was never taken off and then added back. It was just kind of taken off or chipped away as the years went by to put on a specific CIPs, mm -hmm. but it wasn't a decrease and then later increase. So it would have stayed within um, pretty close to the um, actual budget for that specific CIP. Okay. So you don't have the exact amount of what was actually. I have the amounts that were transferred onto other CIPs. Um, however, it just gets a little bit difficult to trace because the scope in reading the text of the scope of the CIP at beginning to end doesn't seem uh, super far off because it was moved within the corridor. Um, mm -hmm. But I can, if you like more details on the exact breakout of the money is transferred within, we can provide that information. Yeah, I'm just curious, you know, just how that works. So thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so I, that took us halfway through your presentation. Is that I, what I understood? Yes. So then we can move on to the bikeway um, program report now, if that's all right. Feel free to continue. Yes. Okay, wonderful. So the bikeway report will display a lot of the same metrics that we've reviewed in the major corridors report. Um, however, the data on page one is kind of the different areas that are bike specific. So the first section you see here is our bikeway miles by phase. So out of the 77 miles that were originally planned for the bike EAP, we uh, had 62.9 of those miles funded for various phases in the FY20 budget. So in this graphic, you'll see the breakdown of where those miles align with the various project delivery phases. So this includes PE, environmental, design, those under construction, and then those open to public. So you can see here that as of the end of June, more than half of the program was within that design phase. And um, we did have a significant increase in the miles in construction as well as we had uh, two new bike projects enter construction, which were our Georgia Mead and Landis bikeways and then our fourth and fifth Avenue bikeways. So those are kind of some of the biggest changes that we've seen from previous years. And then the chart to the right shows you the bikeway miles by fiscal year. So this displays how many bikeway miles we anticipate will be completed or rather open to public for use each fiscal year. So through FY20, we have 8.8 .8 miles complete, um, and we've listed those specific projects below. Um, we are anticipating that fiscal year 21 and 22 will be um, big years for completion of several bikeway projects, as we have a handful that are under construction right now or a couple that are close to completion. And then if we move down, the next section is um, we highlight the bikeway miles and final design review with the city of San Diego. Um, so before, since a good majority of our projects are in the city of San Diego, uh, design plans must be reviewed and approved by the city prior to advertisement to the construction community. So at the close of FY20, there were seven projects pending DSD review at the city. Um, so four of those were new projects that were um, submitted to the city in FY20. So we've listed here the dates um, that those plans were submitted. And then where available, we've included estimated advertised milestone dates. Um, you'll see TBDs for a few of those projects because those are pending full construction funding um, for those. So we uh, wait until we have that identified to give you a uh, estimated date. Um, however, I do wanna um, note also that these uh, estimated advertised dates are contingent on timely approval of the plans by the city's DSD department. 
And then we can move on to the second page. So here, um, this is the leveraging of Transnet funding for the bike program. Um, so there is no Transnet ordinance requirement for leveraging funds for the bikeway program. Um, however, we still like to monitor that to see how we're doing. So overall, um, Transnet funds represent 58% of funding for the bike program, which means we're leveraging 42% of those funds from federal, state, and local sources. And then the next section, support to capital ratio. So we have separated the data based on two categories. So those projects less than $10 million and then those greater than $10 million. Um, so in FY20, the support to capital ratio stayed pretty consistent um, for those projects uh, less than $10 million, a slight um, increase to 70%. However, for those projects that are above $10 million, we did see a decrease down to 43%. Um, which is due to a couple of factors. So we had a couple new projects, um, as I mentioned, that began construction, which helped bring that average down. So um, that were fully funded for construction, which helped bring the average down. So that was our Pershing bikeway and then our university bikeway. So those averages were in the 35 to 40 range. And so that helped bring that average down. Um, in addition, a couple of our CIPs had uh, decreases of about 5% in their average support to capital ratio. So that's kind of why you see a um, bigger um, decrease in that category. And then the next section, so variance between awarded construction contracts and engineers estimates. So we had two design bid build contracts awarded for the bike program. And the lowest bids came in only 4% higher than the engineers estimates. So we generally aim to stay within the 10% variance um, so this is well within that range and pretty accurate in comparison to the engineer's estimates. And then the last metric on the bike report is uh, schedule milestone attainment. So of the three planned advertised milestones, one was accomplished and two were rescheduled to fiscal year 21. Um, the two that were rescheduled, the main causes of delay in both projects was extended DSD review times, um, as well as ongoing right-of-way negotiations or utilities. And then in, there were no planned open to public milestones for the bikeway program, so there's no new data to report there. Um, and that concludes my summary of this report, and I'd be happy to take any other questions on this or the previous report as well. Well, thank you very much for, for both presentations. Before we take it back to committee, I'd like to check with the clerk, to see if we have any members of the public who'd like to speak on the issue. Tessa? Thank you, Chair. I do not see any hands raised on item 13. Thank you very much. Uh, questions for Ms. Gonzalez from the committee, Vice Chair House? Uh, could you go back to the table where this for the city DSD reviews? I just have a question. Um, so like the first one, Pershing Bikeway, plans under review. Uh, it says December 2018. What does that date signify? Is that the first time it was submitted or because here yes. we are in twenty. So why is it taking this long? Yes, that does represent, um, for all of those projects, that does represent the date that those were submitted. Um, for Pershing, um, I believe that part of the reason for delay has been um, there are ongoing negotiations on that segment um, between the city and um, SDGE for utilities reasons. Mm -hmm. So I think they are trying to sort out fully the utilities issues before uh, fully approving the design plans. But that definitely, as you can see, has taken much longer than we would like. Um, we usually try to estimate that hopefully that these plans will be approved within a year um, and we're pushing almost two years. So that is um, something that we are monitoring closely and trying to work through at this time. What about the ones in May of 2019, June, August, November? That's still over a year. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The so I know that the since as you can see, there's one, two, there's seven projects there. So um, we've kind of been able to ramp up and com complete a lot of our design plans um, and submit them as they're available. But this has created a backlog with the city. Um, Barrio Logan has significant right of way challenges, which I think has also contributed to delay and approval of those plans. Um, but if, I don't know if Linda called the bikeway program manager is online, but she might be able to speak more to this as well. 
Yes, she is. And I just asked production to promote her to a panelist. Uh, just for, for personal experience, the Barrio Logan was, uh, was heavily involved with the rail, both the, the light rail and the freight. And to, to anytime you're dealing with rail in a plan checking process, they're out of town, uh, they're plan checking their own uh, processes. So that, that had a lot to do with the delays on that project in plan checking. Ms. Culp? Yes, hi, good morning. Um, and um, thanks for the opportunity to, to weigh in. Um, you know, Chelsea is right. No one is, is uh, happy with this table. We work, continue to work closely with the city of San Diego on these reviews. For Pershing Bikeway, it has been, um, you know, in addition to the utility um, issue that Chelsea mentioned, um, a various, um, various reasons. We go through, uh, we're on about our fifth round of comments from the city. Um, we have one final sign off for that project. So we're hoping that is finished very soon. Um, but there's a number of issues um, related to uh, Pershing as the other ones. And um, part of the reason I think that um, Corson Smith, who was with me um, at your last meeting talked about, you know, they, they have a lot of developer work. They have a lot of competing work. Um, and we're kind of uh, submitting and sort of competing with their other work. Um, uh, the other challenge we've had consistently is um, that we'll propose um, a number of non-standard items for the city to review. And uh, it's not that they're particularly new to um, other cities, but they are new to the city of San Diego, for example. So they are concurrently developing standards so that the reviewers um, have something, you know, a standard to compare to when we submit plans. And so that's been going concurrently. Um, and I think that's caused some delays as we work through some of these newer features for some of the reviewers. Um, so there's just a few examples. Um, happy to take any other questions or comments that you have. Thank you, Linda. Thanks for the explanation. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the committee members? Mr. Halpern. Yeah, I guess mine is a little bit along the same line. Um, you know, last meeting, the uh, representatives from the city were very gracious in coming and helping us understand where things are from their standpoint. And I guess, you know, th there were no real specifics given, but the impression that I uh, took away from that meeting was, and I think they even recall them using words to uh, the effect of, you know, them expecting things to move along, you know, much more quickly, log jam broken, that kind of thing. And yet it still seems, you know, again, based on this schedule that at least the advertised milestone dates are still pretty far out from where we're sitting today. And, um, you know, I don't know, I guess I would ask you guys independently, are, are you not quite feeling so optimistic about the city sort of breaking the log jam or, you know, just maybe elaborate a little bit further on reconciling, on the one hand, the city last meeting talking about, you know, breaking that log jam, but yet it apparently not quite yet showing up and when we're going to be starting to do some of the advertising. Um, yeah, that's a great question. And, um, you know, we're doing a few things. Um, we continue to have weekly meetings between myself and Mr. Smith and others at DSD. Um, and those, you know, we usually bring specific comments or specific issues and, and, and uh, the reviewers will track those down and respond. And then we have a quarterly meeting um, with the management between SANDAG and the City um, Development Services Division and Public Works. And so we just had one of those on Friday. We were talking about this issue and we are hopeful that those three at the top that have been there the longest, um, two of them having grant funding, which has time constraints on it. Um, those, we hope that um, that log jam is broken in the next few months. We push out the advertised milestone because of this, but also we do have an internal process once we get it back from DSD, we have a process to go through to get it advertised. Uh, if it's over $5 million, um, you know, we go to the board um, for approval and that kind of thing. So that takes us a little time to 
um, in, in the advertised part. Um, we continue just to, to, I don't know, you can tell I'm a bit frustrated, um, but we just continue to work through these things um, and, um, you know, just respond as quickly as we can. Uh, but part of that is, you know, on our end, if we get additional comments late in the review, it does take our design engineers time to respond, to redesign if necessary and that kind of thing. So that, that all goes on um, as well. It's also on our side, but it's also part of getting new comments late in the process. And so that's one of the things that we're trying to work on so that doesn't happen, that we can cover those early in the process and then kind of move on through the process a little quicker. Got it. Yeah, I guess that makes sense to They may, you know, sort of speeding things up in terms of providing feedback, but then their feedback may complicate the work and needing to take more time on your end. So that makes sense. Got it. Okay, appreciate that. Thank you, Linda. You're welcome. Any other questions for staff from committee? Seeing none, hearing none, I thank staff for their presentation. And we will move on to the next item here, which is item number 14, the continuation of public comments. Do we have any comments from the general public related to items that are not on the agenda that might have occurred to people since the beginning of the meeting? Tessa? Thank you, Chair. I do not see any continued public comments at this time. All right, I do well, see. Stuart Halpern's hand is still raised, but I don't know if that's just not lowered from the previous item. Sorry, I need to lower that. I will get that done, sorry. Thank you. All right, and uh, upcoming meetings, item number 15, our upcoming meetings, we set that earlier in the day with December 9th. So we will see you all December 9th at 10 a.m. I guess we're pushing it back a half hour. Um, before we adjourn the meeting, are there any comments from the committee or committee members for the greater good? Anything you'd like to share with staff or for, uh, uh, for other committee members? No? All right, well, with that, we'll go ahead and adjourn. Uh, thank you very much for your attendance and for the quality of the presentations. And we will see you all on December 9th. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much.